with that, we'll start with Nina um, introducing herself. Hi everyone, um, so I am a copywriter, I'm 23, and I didn't know I was going to be here, ever. Um, I studied strategic sales and marketing and management, so every time I say it, it's like a, a huge mouthful. Advertising was not on my radar, I had no clue. Um, that it existed. I didn't know that people sit in rooms and come up with ideas every day and get paid for that. Um, advertising was an, a, a foreign concept. Um, I identify heavily with um, knowing who you are and my personality trait is ENFP so that means I'm a campaigner. It means so people that are heavily driven by their emotion and that that idea of being driven by emotion isn't something that you that is synonymous with the workplace. Your emotions are personal, and everything else goes um, goes to work with you. You leave your emotions at home, but I don't think that's the case. But I think we'll get into that a bit more after Katie. Um, so this is me. Um, I am now a creative learning consultant and producer. Um, so I've spent 15 years working in the industry, both commercially and um, as uh, in pretty much informal creative education. It's a sort of hafu hafu split on that now. I've um, been doing it, yeah, about equally on both. Most importantly, um, I'm a Midlander and a mum. I, after the commercial side of things, spent uh, nearly five years at DNAD. I set up the what was then the Graduate Academy, became the New Blood Academy, and went on to run the awards and the festival there. But the main event is the girlhood, which um, upon leaving DNAD, I, um, I set up with a fellow sister in crime, um, Natalie Rosen, who was then a Teach First teacher. It was basically um, a very s a simple concept, which is actually incredibly complex. But at the time, I just felt like um, we weren't seeing enough girls coming through, but it wasn't just girls, it was rich and mix. Um, and purposefully didn't really use the word diversity rightly or wrongly. Um, we just knew that something wasn't right and we needed to do something about it. And being in this sort of vein of let's just try and do, um, we, we went for it. And over the first two years, um, we worked with 200 girls from ages 14 to 24. Um, the objective changed slightly depending upon the age range. Initially, um, with the younger age group, it was more about um, introducing them to commercial creative careers. We found that the girls that we were, um, that we were meeting, that were coming um, onto the projects, um, which then were sort of more like half day or day long um, workshops, were very much in touch with culture, but as consumers, not as producers. So um, the, the big role there was to sort of introduce them to industry and break down what the processes were behind the things that they were consuming. Um, and it was absolutely incredible to see how quickly these young women could pick this up and actually how immensely creative they were. And then at the other end of the scale, um, was the five-week traineeship, which is Nina and, and when we um, interacted with Nina and Cynthia, um, and that was our older age range, and that was a slightly different objective, which was we wanted to try and just have a really open recruitment to see how we could get young women um, into the industry uh, on the basis of asking them if they wanted to be creative every day. Um, and also start to focus on things that I was starting to feel were missing in the young people that were predominantly graduates that I was meeting um, year on year, hundreds of them through New Blood. And that was that there was this phenomenal standard of creative work, but I never felt like I really knew any of them. And year on year, I started to get this feedback from the judges that were, that were um, judging the awards, that it was like, where's the youth spirit? Where's the experimentation? How, you know, how do I know who these people are? And it really hit home in 2013, I think it was. I wrote a Make Your Mark brief with Let's Be Brief. If you don't know Let's Be Brief, look them up. They are absolutely brilliant. Um, and we were just gobsmacked, really, at the responses that we got back that people, it was literally about tell us your story creatively tell us your story. You don't need to know exactly who you are. Uh, I mean, you know, still now, I don't know exactly, and we sort of put that into the brief that it could just be your ongoing story or your, you know, where you are now. Um, and people really struggled with it. And to me, I, I found that sort of quite 
worrying. So taking a step back from just thinking about the creative skill sets, it was like, what's really important here? And actually, what's really important is getting to know who you are creatively and what makes you unique and how you then express that to the world. So that was kind of what we started to introduce and test with the girlhood. And well, and this is as simple as it sounds. We are still, unfortunately, absorbing, limiting, damaging, harmful, um, ridiculous, uh, and just shit, shit work um, that is having an effect on girls and boys. So again, just to rewind, the original um, idea was that if we change the input, we can change the output. Everything is, that we do is based around character, culture and creative practice, with actually character being probably the most important thing that we do. And I'm sure the, the girls will attest to the fact that even though we were sort of setting industry for five weeks and it was very much focused about getting into industry, we spent the majority of our time thinking about and exploring who each of the girls were and how they could um, express that because the culture and the creativity is what you guys will, will bring with you through your sort of just through existing and then also through your education. But it seems to me that there just seems to be a, a real lack of, um, of focus and, and space and time given over to thinking about yourselves. So the reason why I said I'd always wanted to do the talk with two people um, from the girlhood is that I'm not a good person to talk to you about diversity. I am now a white, middle-class woman. Um, I do have working-class roots. Unless I make it back to the motherland, I think um, I, I'm, I am now middle-class. Fuck. Um, so, you know, it, it's not for me to talk about. So when we have the really um, pertinent and, and um, important issues that we've got today, um, it's not me you want to hear from. So. Um, but there, apart from our obvious differences, then we do have like a whole, you know, plethora and, and layers to sort of who we are. So hopefully our different experiences will give you something interesting to build on. So when Katie asked me what would my line be for, for coming into the industry and starting in um, as, as a person that wants to look for a role in an advertising agency, it was kind of like, Mama, where are you? Kind of feel like finding Nemo, you're trying to look for the person that's going to like lead you to where you're supposed to be and um, that's kind of what I struggled with because I was in my final year of university and all my friends were had done um, placement years at amazing companies and it was time to like figure out what I wanted to do and I had no idea I was applying for stuff that I have no clue about um, if you ask me what I applied for in my final year I don't even know I just didn't know that I'd be here and I didn't know that um, the industry is very exclusive, is very elitist, and if you don't know somebody that's in the industry, or if you don't have a friend of a friend whose mum works at Facebook or Twitter, you're not going to be you're not going to be there. So I think those things that are your disadvantage, you will learn, are the things that are to your advantage. You just have to be able to pick those things apart. So for example, I'm quite obviously a black woman, and I didn't know that I was a black woman until I started working. Um, and everybody <laughs> makes you know that that is who you are. I walk into my office and there is a very clear um, conversation that's had when I walk into the kitchen and you can't even see me because obviously I'm invisible and um, somebody else walks in and it's like, hey, how are you doing? And I don't have the privilege of being able to discern whether they're ignoring me because they don't know who I am or they're ignoring me because I'm the other in the... In the um, in the agency, so I think being able to discern, being able to discern when when those things happen because of your race, or gender, or whatever the case is for you, is is a matter of privilege. So I I obviously you don't have that. And I think so that ties in. So my points were around like logistically versus holistically. And logistically, it's all about network, and on a very different level. Like I remember just coming from the Midlands and not having any network um, and knowing how, um, you know, how difficult it was to break through. And that was always one of the things. And DNAD provided me with the most ridiculous, you know, address book of people to call on. Um, and, and I was very singular in my focus of what I wanted to do with that once I'd got it. And that was to fucking completely blow it open and, and, and hand it over to those people that, that didn't have it. And I think 
Um, speaking of privilege, you guys are in, in London and again, from going up and down the country with New Blood, it can be really, really hard to make those connections. You know, you are really privileged to be in London and, and, and you need to make the most of those things. And I, and I definitely think universities in London are, are good at the logistic bit. Holistically, it kind of ties in still to my point around character that I don't necessarily think you're being prepared as, br as best you can be for university. Uh, sorry, for industry. Um, I say that generally. I don't mean specifically at Ravensbourne. It just comes back to the comments that we sort of continuously had. So, if you're um, putting together your portfolios and you're not kind of giving the time um, to think about you and how you create and the kind of things that you're interested in and actually it's been set up very nicely from everyone on the panel because that's kind of been the point that everyone's made you need to really do that because it is genuinely what the pe what people who will be hiring you really want to find out about so i had the opportunity to do the girlhood i did the girlhood first and then i did another um, program straight after that and i said put the weed in the bag because it's literally that process. So the analogy comes from Charlemagne the God, who um, wrote a book, which you should all read because it's incredible. Um, so he says that you, as an intern, it gets very easy to forget about the process. So you already want to, you know, you've got the ounce and you're already thinking about all the things that you're going to buy with that weed money, but you haven't even put the weed in the bag yet. So you need to put the weed in the bag, get it to the dealer, and then get him to get it to whoever's buying it, get that money, and it all goes back. So it's all in the process. And um, in that, I did the girlhood, which in terms of monetary value, didn't pay that much compared to the other program that paid so much more. But in, in terms of value, I got so much more from the girlhood. And I remember the last day of the girlhood, and we were all sitting in... Um, in the office and I was weeping. I was crying so much that my head hurt. And um, we were just all looking at each other like, what the hell have we done? What have we done? We spent five weeks here and it was amazing. And I was now like, this is what I want to do. This is where I want to be. I want to be a copywriter. And this is where I can see the trajectory of my career going. And then I did this other program, which was two months similar to the girlhood, but just didn't have that same impact on me and you then realize that it's not really about how much they pay you because when you get into a position where you could be paid more so the money versus how you feel the the what you can give to the the agency how you feel when you wake up in the morning how you feel when you get there those things are more important than if they pay you 10 times more than the thing that you love so you need to be able to put the weed in the bag understand the process and be able to choose the things that are best for you because I'm sure you all have peers that are doing amazing things but you can't put yourself in a position where you're constantly comparing yourself to them or else you're going to lose your mind. Do what's good for you, put the weed in the bag and let the process do itself. And I guess just to give you some context of, um, of those the five weeks, um, we would have loved to have paid them more, but it was a really fucking hard sell. So I had this idea that I really wanted to get these, find these amazing girls do this learning program that was also vocationally based, try and get some of them jobs, or they would get themselves the jobs, sorry, but try and help them get those jobs at the end of it, but pay them to do it. So I had to go around from agency to agency and say, I want to do this program, it's five weeks, I need you to pay us, pay them, and don't necessarily know what's going to happen. <laughs> Um, and then we, we got the money and then we just fucked off, didn't we, to a separate building and, um, and kind of just had an amazing five weeks and just went rogue and tried these kind of different things. So we did our best to pay as much as we possibly could. It was a, it was a very hard sell. Well, value going over money, my point is value <laughs> yeah. over money. You don't, you don't need to be paid crazy amounts, especially in the beginning of your career. You're going to have to um, earn that. Because if you have that period, that, those five weeks showed me so much about who I am. And like Katie said, character is the most important thing because what you do isn't who you are. When people ask you what you do, you automatically say your job and that's not who you are. The things that keep you up at night, those are the things that are who you are. And if you can understand that 
that there's going to be money. It's going to come. It's going to, it's going to come. It's going to go. There's always going to be the chance to you know, blow it all on a Louis bag. Like You can do it, but you have to choose the, you have to make the right decision in the beginning for, for the process to work the way that it should. And that's perfect, because actually, uh, one of the very first activity, like tasks that we did came about through my interaction with so many grads. And we used to do the thing around sort of presenting yourself. And everyone used to use animator, illustrator, designer. And I think somebody touched on it earlier. It's like, guess what? Every other fucker is. So, you know, what we do, like, write all those things down and then just put, put them aside and, and actually, um, you know, keep doing the, this task. And it's really interesting for the people who realise if they know themselves well or not because you do have to keep writing, keep writing, don't self-edit. And at the end of the task, some people don't really have that much there. And it's a bit of a shocker. You know, and, and it was great because we we had five weeks to really get to grips with all of that. But it's a really good it's a really good thing to do and keep all of those skills. They are really valuable, and, and we you know we will come on to that. But don't define yourself by them. Um, so I won't bang on about that. I'll just say in terms of internships um, and live projects, yes, internships are good if they're paid. Don't do them if they're not. Um, ev you know, even there has to be some kind of monetary exchange going on. Um, but do try and balance commercial and experimental. I think it's an interesting time for young creatives because you are going to be challenged for the roles by people that aren't coming through traditional routes. The, the point for you, if, if you are going to dedicate three or four years of coming through university, is to hone your craft and to get that balance of experimentation, personal experimentation, and commercial work. So I'll just start off by saying, oh, let's not talk about definitions. We don't really give an arse about definitions. We're, everybody wants to be sort of commercial creative, which means essentially everyone just wants some, some work. So we won't worry about the semantics of it all. I think the interesting point on this is the um, economical and sustainable practice. Privilege, obviously, is such uh, a huge thing and white privilege in in particular i think a lot of you in here are already at an advantage to so many creatives that want to come into the industry you've already started working on briefs there's a lot of creatives right now that are coming in the the new wave of creatives that don't even know what a brief is what what is that why should i care about the client like, i just want to make the work that i love and that's kind of that their mindset but you kind of have that way of thinking that could work to your advantage if you use it um, privilege for me um, comes from right now me being able to push to the back of my head what's happening in Libya and um, waking up in the morning and going to get coffee and pay for it that that in that sense that's privilege for me but um, when I have the conversation about diversity at work I don't have the privilege to be able to discern whether um, people are making comments or don't trust my um, recommendations because I'm a black woman or because it's just a shit idea um, so privilege is so important and I think for for yourselves if you're white and being here you're already privileged so you need to be accountable for those things um, obviously you didn't choose to wake up the person that you are but you have to be um, accountable and be aware of how much your position in the industry affects everybody else so if you if you end up working at an agency and it's 250 people and there are only five people of colour, you kind of have a duty to be like, hey, um, what the hell's going on here? Do only white people come up with great ideas? I think it's important for you to, to take that initiative. And I think one of these guys talked, uh, spoke about don't wait for permission. Um, and it being 2017, you should be using your privilege to the advantage of everyone and not just to yourself. Because if you're thinking about you want to be the senior art director, you want to be whatever you want to be, you can't get there without everybody else. So you have to be, you have to be someone that helps everybody else through the journey or else no one will help you. Absolutely, I think you know, that's what we're starting with saying. Like my, my privilege um, means I'm definitely not the person to talk about it, but I am one of the people to do something. Um, and again, I think we'll probably come on to that. Currently, and perhaps ongoing, the girlhood is a fuck with the system initiative. Um, most stuff, and we were talking about this earlier, um, it's something that I always 
kind of struggle with whether to fuck with the system or fuck the system and just do something completely different um, and constantly try and evaluate what will be most valuable um, and useful to those people that I would genuinely like to help. Um, but I think it's relevant here because um, you're going to come, come up against that and um, thinking about your sort of long term um, sustainability as a creative. Because if you're going to go back to thinking about your character and, and who you are and really invest in that, that might not always put you in, in the, the best position for certain people, i.e. You, know, you might not fit in somewhere if you are going to truly stay true to who you are. And then you kind of need to start making decisions in terms of what you want to do. Um, and I think that's around like you know, drawing a line personally and creatively. Sometimes um, when I was doing New Blood, I used to really worry that we're kind of really trying to push. And um, so I'd introduce the, the white pencil into New Blood and across all the briefs um, that we were really charging people up to do, do good work that does good things. And then people would get into industry and they'd have like a really sort of questionable brand or project to work on. Um, and it's quite a big thing to, to ask people to draw that line. But I think now it, it's possible. Um, I think before it, it was maybe too scary that you thought, I know I certainly did, again, just talking earlier, um, when I was industry side, I worked on automotive and I would a lot of the time be like the only girl. And I, I'm, I'm really embarrassed to say that, you know, I did sort of assume the role of being the only girl and I put up with a lot of shit because I didn't feel that like I could draw my line. But I think now sort of the line is out there um, there's a collective sort of appreciation of the line, um, even if maybe not by the arseholes, but you know, we can all support each other with that. So I think that's, that's probably a big thing to consider with that. <sighs> um, <laughs> <laughs> I think this is my biggest frustration. So you're embarrassing yourself comes from, so I started last year in the industry and I, was, I used to be so excited to go to these diversity events because I thought, oh my God, this is amazing. People are sitting in rooms and they're talking about the issue and we're going to get something done. And this is great. I just love it. And then um, fast forward to now and I've had to, I wrote an article a couple of weeks ago about why I'm no longer t attending diversity events. So imagine sitting in a room and... Um, People are talking about why you you matter, why your position in the workplace is 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 important, and why they now need to convince other people in the industry that you should be there. And I just thought I'm being spoken about like I'm not even being spoken about like a human being. I'm being spoken about like a, a strategic plan. And I think one of the ladies said, if we if we talk about diversity the way we do when we're um, implementing a new strategy, then surely everybody would, would be on, on hand and they would want to be involved. We shouldn't do it in a separate room. We should get the whole agency involved. And I wanted to throw up because I was just like, you guys sound ridiculous. You're talking about human beings and you're talking about how you're going to use money to, to bring these people in because obviously you can't find them. And I went to um, the Black History Month celebration at Google and I was looking around in the room and I... I was almost in tears because I was looking around and I was surrounded by so many incredible black talent and, and Asian talent and I was just like, what do they mean they can't find them? What do they mean that we, do, we don't know where they are? Because they're all here. If they're here, surely there must be a place for you to look for them because you're not, you're not trying hard enough. And the, um, the sentiment is um, diversity is good for business and, it, and, and it's, um, it will help the economy. But I feel like if that was the case, they would have done it already. The future of innovation and the future of tech has been um, the thing that we talk about. It's a new, we need to talk about um, tech, we need to talk about the future of automation, which is obviously important when moving forward and these things are changing the way we consume. But those things don't really matter if you still go to work every day and all of your colleagues are from the same experience or from the same type of, of background. There's not, there's not anything that you could do in terms of automation when your agency isn't as representative as it should be uh, and that it can be in 2017. So you need to, when you look in the mirror in the morning, you need to make sure that you're not going to work to embarrass yourself. And that definitely just, just leave if you're at a diversity talk. And my thing is like shut up and dance because I need a couple of 90s references in here. But um, <laughs> yes, there we go. Um, 
basically, I don't think anybody should be allowed to talk about it in general. The only thing people should be allowed to talk about is things that they've done. So unless somebody's going to talk about something that they've done, move on. This has been a topic of conversation this week, so um, I thought we'd just summarise. Um, so I think from, from my experience at university, I, had, I did four years, and both the best and the worst thing about university was time. So you get so much time off, you get your summer off, and you have the opportunity to do whatever you want. So you can go, you can travel, you can um, do a placement, you can start your own project. And when I was at university, I did that. I spent a summer in New York and I spent a summer in California and it was amazing. But then um, I had like other friends or peers that just didn't really do anything with their summers. Um, and I think like you, you'll get a month off for Easter and you'll get a, like three or four months off for, for, sum, uh, for summer. Do, like, do something with it. Look for placements that are summer placements. Google do them. Universal do them. Um, look for things to do with your time. If there's been a thing that you go to bed thinking about, do it. Don't wait for someone to say, yeah, sure, that's a really great idea because your friends, your peers are focusing on themselves and it's, it's kind of like a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Like, no one is thinking about you. You need to get up and go and do those things for yourself. And in having all of that time to do all these things, you also have a lot of time to do nothing. So there were times where I just wouldn't really go to my lecture because who wants to fucking wake up at 9 o'clock? I didn't want to do that. And I lived like five minutes from, from uni, so I could have woken up at 8.50, had a quick shower, and then gone to uni. But I just thought, I'm going to be at uni at 9 o'clock. There's going to be no one there because nobody else wants to go at 9 a.m. So why should I be that person? So use your time. Don't waste it, and if, if I could get those summers back, I would, because right now I have to take permission to go on holiday, and I hate that. I get 23 days, and it's a joke. So, <laughs> use your time. Um, mine's the same, but I guess focus on different things. Just to reiterate, use your time to fully explore who you are, because you have that, you know, that's an amazing thing that you, that you have right now. The flip side of that is, don't spend too long like running over work. The strive for, for perfection that we used to see could absolutely be paralysing for some people. Um, and so I think that's you know definitely like trying not to hold on too tightly to things because that certainly isn't how the, the industry works. So being able to sort of to move on. Um, and then just a, a final thing that I, I wanted to share with you um, as one of the research pieces that I did a couple of years ago. It was actually commissioned by Pearson University. And it was to map the tech enabled creative businesses and what they, uh, agencies and studios, and what they were looking for in terms of entry level creatives. And it just hopefully sort of proves my points on the skill set about character. And, and that is that, you know. The majority of the agencies and studios that I spoke to, um, it was about principles over practice. So again, your understanding of like how things work and why you're doing them. The most interesting and uh, something that I'm a firm believer is in this sketchbook over portfolio, and that people were actually starting to hire on sketchbooks over portfolios. And that's not to devalue all the final work that you're doing, which is really, really wonderful. But a lot of the value I think that young people have, um, or young creatives have, um, it's just a brilliant mind, a very agile, very nimble, um, an interesting mind, and it's the sketchbook that really showcases that. And it's that type of thinking that, um, that a lot of um, companies are looking for. And then again, one of the things that I sort of positioned to them was this kind of person versus professional, like what is it that you're looking for? And again, it was very, very much about, about the person over the professional. Um, and if you're going somewhere that doesn't necessarily hold those values, then it comes back to my sort of, you know, drawing the line thing. Perhaps it's not, it's not the place to be. Like, seek out those places because ultimately, good people hire good people, so you'll be in a good place. Um, and one more thing about um, the ideas that you have. So, you, you, you're going to have so many ideas, and when you're, I think Katie said this to me, but when you're twenty percent sure about an idea, it's too early. When you're forty percent sure about an idea that's the right time to do it. If you're 70% sure, somebody's already done it. Mm -hmm. So when you're just at the point where you think, oh, I just need to just need to do that big, that little thing and it will be perfect, but there's no such thing as perfection and you're gonna keep looking to add something else and it will be, you'll keep adding until you've, you've ruined it. So when you are just about like, okay, I can do this, that's when you should just get it out because 
you're going to keep waiting and all those ideas are you're going to lose them. So when you're 40% sure about an idea, do it. And that, basically, every single one of the girls was incredible on, like on a personal level and every single opportunity that I have to tell anybody from industry how wonderful they are. Um, and all of them, each and every one of them, is definitely going to have a, a long and illustrious career. That's it. Thank you very much.